So just a reminder, our whole series this summer is Living the Questions. You all, the people of Plymouth, have submitted questions, and we, your pastors, continue to attempt to address them every week. I really wanted to hear from you all today, though. This is such a good question, and one that theologians have been talking about for quite some time. Karl Barth, Reinhold Niebuhr, but Karl Mike Marx might have been the most outspoken about this one. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you the question, and then I'm going to give you about three minutes to either think or talk with the people in your pews about the question. What is your answer? Here's the question. I'll ask it twice. Is religion just a human construct? Is religion just a human construct? Think and discuss your answer, yes or no, and why do you think that? You have three minutes. Go. Okay. So what do you think? Is religion just a human construct? If you're leaning towards yes, just leaning even, raise your hand or write it in the comments if you're joining us online. Ready, go. Raise your hands. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. If you're leaning towards no, again, raise your hand or put it in the comments. Loud and proud, loud and proud. Okay. All right, that's good. Does anyone want to share why they chose that? We had some good answers on Saturday night. Oh, yes, Jared Walter. I'm bringing you this microphone. <laughs> Betty, will you pass it down the row? Mike's hot. Well, I was talking to um, Dave and Jean Nelson here, and Dave brought up a really good point about the way you phrased your question just. We don't really kind of like that word in your question um, because we kind of feel that God's in all creation, not just human. Amen, Jared Walter. It's Anyone else want to share? It's possible that the human construct was inspired by God. Ah. Theologians in the house today. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? I made him. <laughs> well, we're reading a book in Amen's, and it talks about the different religions in this country. But the one thing that stuck out to me is that when uh, Europeans came to this country or to this part of the world, there were Indians who had believed in the Great Spirit in very different ways. Um, and I think David's right is that that probably was inspired by God uh, and all over the world that's been interpreted different ways. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Oh, good. Okay, I'm coming. This is a part of the job that I didn't expect at Plymouth Church. We do a lot of fast walking here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I said yes because I think it's more an interpretation and based on where you grew up and how you grew up and based on culture. So like in different religions, a god or many gods might be interpreted different by different people. Awesome. Thank you. Another theologian. This is good. Does anyone else want to share? We can do one more. Someone's pointing at you, buddy. Do you want to share? Oh, good. Will you pass down here? I'll come right in here. Pass over there. Thank you. I would agree with the person who just spoke. I think the dinosaurs came first, didn't they? Well, I say yes. There are so many different religions, and they all have something to say. I think the Bible is made up of metaphors. And I do think Mother Nature and God had something to do with it. But it has to be human because we came later. And who wrote the Bible? That's my answer. Thank you. 
Thanks everybody for playing along. Now I'm going to come back here and I think that maybe our scripture for today might help us, you know, just get on into this a little bit more. Let's see. So our scripture for today is from the first book of the Bible. That's Genesis. And just some context for our scripture today before we start. So the person in the story is Jacob, and Jacob stole his brother Esau's birthright. Esau was pretty unhappy with Jacob for obvious reasons. Esau is sent away to marry. Jacob gets duped into marrying the sister of the woman who he really wanted to marry and having to work for their father for a really long time. And then he finally strikes a deal with their father and heads back towards home with his whole family. But he catches wind that his brother Esau is headed to meet him, Esau and his whole army. And so he's pretty nervous. And that's where we're at, traveling along. So let's read. The same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the fjord of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask for my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Here ends this reading of scripture. May God help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So we assume that the man that Jacob is wrestling with is God. Jacob has this very intense physical experience of wrestling with God, presumably for many hours until the sun starts to rise in the morning. God knocks his hip out of its socket and blesses him and gives him the name Israel. Jacob, or Israel, then goes on to continue to be a pretty big deal in the Bible. We live in this time where what is fact and what is true are being debated. Can we just say that facts are true, but there's a lot more to truth than just facts? Take scripture, for example. Here at Plymouth Church, we take scripture really seriously, just not literally. We know that this book and the stories it contains were spoken aloud, telephone style, written down later by people, and edited later by more people. In that case, it is indeed humanly constructed. But just because these stories may not have happened exactly how they are written doesn't mean they aren't true. This story holds to light an undeniable existential truth. We wrestle with God. We wrestle with our faith. It is true in a very significant way. It is a human experience across all ages. From the three-year-old stopping me in the hallway after church right outside of Waveland asking me this question. When was God born? I didn't know the answer. Then there's other, other things like the person on the phone asking the question from last week. Why evil? Why bad things? 
And then the young adult who painfully stated, I don't want to be mistaken as one of those Christians. This scripture is true, people of God. We wrestle with our faith. And yet what I have come to realize is that our human understanding of God is indeed a human construct. Because God is bigger and greater and altogether more than we in our human words and experiences can even begin to describe. And yet we keep trying. We try to describe who God is, what God does, where God is at work in the world, because the mysteries of the world, the mystery of God is just too enticing. Our experiences of God require telling and sharing and writing down. Our experiences of God throughout the ages are powerful and meaningful and deeply personal. They're woven into the very fabric and purpose of our lives. And I think it's just that that is happening in this story. What's up with all of the naming and renaming stuff that's going on here? God gives Jacob a new name, Israel. And then Jacob gives this place, this place where he powerfully experienced the presence of God, a new name, Peniel. And those names carry meaning and purpose. Jacob is no longer Jacob, he is Israel, father of many nations. This land is Peniel, seeing God face to face. Names, but also stories and religion, are just ways that we join into a tradition of meaning-making. Because we may be too small and too limited to actually see God face to face, but we know that God is true. Barbara Brown Taylor says in her book, Holy Envy, she says this, Religions are treasure chests of stories and songs, rituals and ways of life that have been handed down for millennia. Not covered in dust, but evolving all the way. So that each new generation has something to choose from when it is time to ask the big questions about life." End quote. Yes. Yes, we have the true blessing of joining in this long tradition of human constructing, of giving things new names and telling the scripture stories, telling of our own experiences of God at work in the world. And together, all those things help us to understand the mystery of God just a little bit more. So I thought I might share some of those today. Just a couple of the experiences of God I've had during my time here at Plymouth. The first that comes to mind is the evening someone asked me for the best study Bible recommendation to buy after coming to Wednesday night Bible study. It was their very first Bible that they'd ever had. The Holy Spirit reminded me that it's never too late to start or to start again. God keeps pursuing us no matter what. And that learning about who we are in connection to God is a worthy and spirit-filled journey. This blessed opportunity reminded me that God is indeed still speaking and gosh darn inspiring. Then October 20th, 2019. It is certainly not guaranteed that, or it's certainly guaranteed that not every sermon is going to be a slam dunk. But sometimes the Spirit speaks loud and clear. Some of you might remember that sermon on friendship in the age of social media that I preached back in the fall of 2019. I know the 75 high schoolers that were behind me at the 9 o'clock service, they don't forget that one. There were shouts of fear and horror that I could hear from the pulpit saying, no, don't do it, don't do it, as I revealed some of the secrets of social media that they had been able to keep from many of their grown-ups until that moment. (laughs) But while many of those teens still gave me the side-eye for a few days, 
My office was a steady stream of all ages for weeks after. By the grace of God, the Spirit spoke. She nudged a grandparent to have an important conversation with a granddaughter. A tense relationship mended. And some of those same horrified teens showed up to talk. And we formed lasting relationships that made it so I was there to witness God at work and the young people of this church. And it reminded me that children are not the future of the church. They are the present. And they are so incredibly bright and funny. Which brings me to the holy laughter I have experienced here at Plymouth. Laughter can be a healing balm in the midst of hard times. That's how I know God's got to be a part of it. This building has been awfully quiet over the past year. Leading worship in front of a camera and trying to picture the congregation, you all, was not an easy feat. We missed you. I missed you. But then rushing put on a toddler-sized construction vest from Plymouth Nursery, it almost ripped. And then Lindsay got up and hid behind our Lenten backdrop looking for bears. And Leanne got up on chairs and ladders with a tripod trying to get the best angle. And the hours of blooper reels that dear Alex Cooney must have contain the most precious gift. Holy laughter. Healing balm. And I was reminded that God is powerfully present through the great, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So is religion just a human construct? No. Religion is not just a human construct. It is a human construct. And it's more. It's also a blessing. A blessing in its way of enabling experiences of God like the ones that I just shared. It's a blessing of what is true beneath it all. And a way to remember that truth when we're limping along. Amen.